OK, so um, let me introduce myself. My name is Jan Schemmler. I'm an associate professor here in physics, um, also a single molecule biophysicist. And I guess uh, TJ asked me to give you a lecture on the technique that I use, which is optical traps, and various applications of this technique uh, in biology. And so I'm going to do that and highlight the work that my lab does. Um, I have a whole bunch of slides. and so depending on how it goes, I can go through a lot of them or not as many of them. It'll depend on what you guys want to hear about. It'll depend if you guys ask me questions. Um, I like lots of questions, so you guys should interrupt me if things are not clear. Um, let me ask you guys, so what, what, what is everyone's background here? Is it mostly physics? OK, but you have interest in biophysics. Is that right? Yeah. For the most part. OK, good. All right. So. Um, the way I structured the talk, um, I'm going to talk a lot about the technique. So by the end of the talk, you should really understand really well how an optical trap works, how we operate it, and the kinds of measurements that we do. So the first half is going to be kind of on, on technical aspects of and historical aspects of uh, how optical traps work. And then I'll be jumping into different applications. Uh, but before I start, I kind of want to give an introduction on, on why my lab would use this technique to study biology. And this is a very introductory slide, but, but the point of this is that uh, the way my lab and a lot of colleagues think about biology, we, we think of the cell as a kind of uh, machine or a factory. So we know from last you know, 50 plus years of, of biology that the cell is, is a lot more than just a homogeneous bag of stuff, right? So it's actually a very complex, highly organized structure where particular tasks are carried out by specialized machinery at certain times. And you can really think of this as kind of a factory, right? So if you look at the cell, more like a picture like this, where there's gears and things like that, they're basically tiny engines that we call molecular motors or molecular machines that are responsible for carrying out uh, these tasks. And so here's a picture of a molecular machine that might be doing something. And these tasks, I would say, these are mechanical tasks. They're basically involving and moving things around because the cell is complex, has different kinds of environments, then it's important to move things from one part of the cell to another, um, and, and so forth. And so these kinds of mechanical tasks are things that my lab is interested in, and they occur over all sorts of length scales and time scales in, in the cell. And so here's a movie that you probably have seen before. How many of you have seen this movie? It's the inner life of the cell. And this is an example. It's a, of course, it's an artist's rendition of what's actually going on. But this guy here is a kinesin. So it's, it's a molecular motor. It's responsible for moving cargo around the cell. Uh, this is what happens inside your neurons, for example. These vesicles would be filled with neurotransmitters. And so they need to move from one part of your neuron uh, to the other. And so directed motion is a big part of what happens inside the cell, because it's not just homogeneous. You need to move stuff from one part of the cell to the other. So that, that's one example of the molecular motion, motion, sorry, molecular machines inside the cell. Um, here's another. Oh, it's not showing up. Where is it? That's strange. Oh. Let's see if I can open it again. I worked a few minutes ago. What's going on? Aha. There we go. OK, how many people have seen this movie? So this is what, what's happening when your DNA needs to be replicated, when you need to make copies of your DNA basically a, a whole set of proteins that work together 
as a molecular machine to perform all the various tasks they need to do to do this. So one of the tasks you need to do is to separate the strands of the DNA, right? You know that double strand DNA has two uh, strands of DNA that are complementary to each other. So you need to split those apart to reveal the base pairs. So you can use those as a template to create more DNA. And then you have things called polymerases that use those templates to fill out the other end and create two daughter strands, like here and here. And this is a very tightly coordinated um, process, right? So this is, again, a type of molecular machine, a mechanical process. Um, and things range all the way to cells themselves. So this is a movie of E. coli. It's kind of hard to see with this light. Can we turn off all the light just for this slide? Right. So these are E. coli cells. You can see that they're propelled by these tails. These are called flagella, and they're basically helical propellers that propel the cell around an aqueous medium. So they can swim around, and they can basically measure what's going on in their environment and decide which way they want to go, which way the nutrients are. And so these are driven by rotary molecular machines. So you can see, turn on the light again, thanks. These kinds of molecular machines, mechanical processes occur over all sorts of length scales in the cell. And so um, we've been interested in, in studying this and finding tools to study them. And I guess an important point I want to make is that you really want to study these things at the level of the single motor or the single molecule. The reason is because unlike machines that are in a factory or your car engine, uh, life at the cellular level is very much stochastic. So Things are happening at the energy scale of the environment, so KT, and so fluctuations pay, play a big role. And so that means that it's very hard for these machines to actually be synchronized. Noise and fluctuations dominate things. And so um, basically, that means that it's, it's, it's very hard to do an experiment where you synchronize all these machines and get them to work together. They'll eventually dephase and, and work uh, slightly differently, and so that motivates looking at these machines at the level of the single molecule. And so that's what single molecule biophysicists do. They develop techniques so they can study these things at the level of the single molecule. So I'm going to talk about one of these techniques, optical traps, which is what we do uh, in my lab. And the basic idea of optical traps is to exploit the fact that light carries momentum to exert forces on microscopic objects. So that's what we're doing. So some historical background. So the first development of an optical trap was by Art Ashkin when he was at Bell Labs. I want you to note the date, 1970. It's a really old idea. Um, and basically what he did, he took um, laser light and focused it through uh, a chamber that was filled with a aqueous medium and some colloid particles. And what he noticed was that the colloid particles would be attracted to where the light was. And then once they got inside the beam, they got pushed through. And so if you put two of these beams together in a counter-propagating direction, he was able to actually hold one of these colloid particles in the middle. And there's a nice statement here in this abstract, a prescient statement. It says, it is hypothesized that similar acceleration and trapping are possible with atoms and molecules using laser light tuned to specific optical transitions. And this predicted what, ev what eventually would happen for um, optical trapping, or atom trapping, right? So AMO, uh, which eventually led to the Nobel Prize in 1997, which Ashkin did not receive, I should say. <laughs> so what is the physics behind, behind this idea here? There's actually a, uh, two forces at work here. One of them is scattering force, and the other one is the gradient force. So scattering force is essentially uh, what happens when an object uh, is hit by light and the light scatters off of it, it basically pushes that object away. It's kind of like uh, using a water hose and pushing some ball with it. The photons are hitting it, they're recoiling back, and so that momentum basically goes into pushing the object forward. And so that is basically proportional to the intensity of light. Okay? Now, another force is the gradient force, and the gradient force happens um, whenever you have a gradient in the electric field. So you probably have seen this equation from uh, freshman E&M. 
So you know that if you put an electric dipole inside of a gradient of electric field, then you can exert a force on it. And people, does that look familiar to people? Yes. Um, so now, if that dipole is not a permanent dipole, but it's an induced dipole, induced by the field itself, let's say you have a polariz polarizable object, something that's dielectric, then essentially this dipole moment is proportional to the electric field, and so now you have a force that's proportional to the gradient of the electric field squared, or the gradient of the intensity of light. So this is actually very analogous to what you see in magnetism, right? When you bring a strong magnet next to a paper clip, what happens is you magnetize the paper clip, and then it becomes attracted to as the magnet because of the gradient in the magnetic field. Same idea here with electricity and the electric field from light. So the idea here is to essentially use the gradient in the intensity of light to exert a force on an object, and it's an attractive force. So to explain uh, Ashkin's experiment, essentially what happened is that when he was shining this light through his, uh, his fluid chambers, uh, these colloids are basically dielectric, so they have, you can have an induced dipole moment. They're attracted to the light because of the gradient in the intensity, right? Because of the gradient force, they basically are attracted to it. And then once they show up inside this beam, then they're pushed by the scattering force and they go over the side. And if you have two counterpropagating beams, then you can cancel the scattering force and basically hold it in place. So these two forces are at the heart of how an optical trap works. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. OK, good. Now it turns out you can form an optical trap with just a single beam. You don't actually need to have two counterpropagating beams. And so we have to wait for 16 years for that to happen. 1986, Ashkin is still involved here, but you also notice somebody else, Stephen Chu, who uh, one of, was one of the recipients of the Nobel Prize in 97. Um, and so they came to realize that you could, in principle, trap an object just with a single beam, provided you just made this gradient force larger than the scattering force. And so let me show you what that actually corresponds to. The basic idea is that if you make your gradient of light strong enough, you can counteract any scattering of your object by, by, uh, by light. So how do you accomplish that? Well, you take your light and then you focus it down by a very good lens, a high numerical aperture lens. That's basically something that's going to tighten your light down to a very tight point. And so the net effect of this is that you're essentially creating a three-dimensional gradient in the intensity of light where, it's, where the light is highest at the middle. So any dielectric object, you know, a micron-sized colloid, for example, or, or a microsphere, is going to be attracted towards the center of, uh, of this light. If it weren't for any scattering force, it would actually fall right at the focus. But because there's some scattering, it gets pushed a little bit off to the side. But provided the gradient force is larger than scattering force, then you can hold it stably in three dimensions at that position. OK, makes sense? Yep. And to a good approximation, essentially what you've done is you've created a harmonic potential. So you've created a linear spring, a hooking spring, just by using light's interaction with a dielectric object. Um, so how much force you exert is going to depend on a lot of things. It depends on the gradient of light. It depends on the dielectric itself, how big this object is. And so I'll tell you in general for you know, a standard optical trap in a lab like mine, uh, you can't trap individual molecules using this technique, but you can trap a micron-sized polystyrene bead, for example. You can trap that in three dimensions stably, and you're essentially creating a trap that has a spring constant of about a tenth of a picanewton per nanometer. And those are kind of the units that are useful for looking at biological processes of, of, that exert forces on the order of picanewtons and move by distances on the orders of, of nanometers. So that's the basic idea. Question. Does gravity matter here? Ah, does gravity matter? Um, for the post, most part, no. So you're using, you're doing this in an aqueous medium, and so there's a buoyant force, right, that's keeping these things up for the most part. So for a polystyrene bead, we basically never have to worry about it. But let's say you were to look at a glass bead, then there, there is a slight effect from gravity. If you were to turn off the trap, you would actually see a net drift of this glass bead going down. But for the most part, it doesn't really matter. Anyone else? No. OK. So 
Okay, so essentially we can use light to manipulate microscopic objects by creating this optical harmonic potential, this 3D harmonic potential. But if we want this to be a quantitative technique, we need more requirements. So here I've listed three requirements. So the first thing is manipulation. We've already solved that. We use that by, by using intense light. So we use laser source and we use a large gradient. We use a high numerical aperture uh, objective to do that, to tighten, to focus this light very tightly. And then you can move this thing around by using piezo stages or, or mirrors or other techniques. So you can manipulate things. But now if you want to be quantitative, you actually need to measure something. So you need to be able to know where this object is in the middle in relative to the trap. So you can measure uh, forces and displacements. So I'm going to show you how you do that. And the last thing is after you measure, you also want to be able to calibrate your, your technique so that you can turn these forces and displacements into useful units like piconewtons or nanometers. So I'm going to tell you how you do that. Okay, so first number two. How do you detect something useful with this? Um, so the standard in the field is to use something called back focal plane interferometry. And you don't have to remember this. The, the idea is pretty simple. What we're going to do is we're going to take the light that's scattered by the trapped object and image that onto a position sensitive photo detector. So the idea is that if you have, let's say, a bead that's trapped in the center of the trap, the light that emerges out of it, this could be the trap light itself or the light from another laser that you align on it, but usually the trap, of the, the, the trap light itself, that's going to display a certain pattern. And now if you displace this bead, let's say perpendicular to your optical axis, then this pattern of light is going to change. In fact, the center of mass of this pattern is going to shift up. Or if you move this object along the optical axis, then this pattern of light is going to get bigger or smaller. You're going to change the collimation. If this helps you think about it, you can think of this bead as a lens, right? And so if you change the lens relative to the path of the light, you're going to change the emerging light. So if you image this onto a position-sensitive photo detector, which you can buy commercially, you essentially get a readout in voltages that tell you uh, where this bead is relative to the center of the trap. Okay? So you can measure a displacement for the object relative to the center of the trap. And that's useful because once you have a displacement, well, you can measure displacements, first of all. You can also turn it into a force because, as I said, the thing is a harmonic potential. So the force is just proportional to the displacement. There's a spring constant there. But once you know that, you can figure out what the force is. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so we can manipulate things, we can measure things, but of course we want to actually get useful units at this, so we need to calibrate it. All right, so we measure these voltages and we want to turn them into displacements and forces and units that are useful, like nanometers or angstroms or piconewtons. And so we need a calibration method. And so there's a, a variety of different calibration methods. The standard one is to use the fact that this thing is sitting inside a, a water bath at room temperature. And so we can use KT to actually calibrate our instrument for us. So the basic idea is that a bead that's inside this harmonic potential is actually not going to stay still, but it's actually going to fluctuate. It's going to move around due to KT of energy, right? It's undergoing Brownian motion, right? And so we can use the fact that this KT is generating this Brownian motion. We can measure the position of this bead as it's undergoing this Brownian motion to calibrate the instrument. And so essentially, we want two calibration parameters. One is how to go from voltage to position in nanometers. That's called alpha. And the second thing we want is how to go from position to force. That's called K. That's the stiffness. And we want these in principle in all three dimensions, x, y, and z. OK. So how we use KT, we use it in two ways. We measure essentially the amplitude of the Brownian motion of the bead inside the optical trap. That's related to KT. It's also related to alpha and k, and then the time scales of these fluctuations tell us about k. And so if we do this in x, y, and z, we actually get um, all six parameters that, that we want. Okay. Um, so let me show you what a, a calibration measurement would actually look like. It looks like this. We measure a power spectrum. So how many people have heard of, what a, of a power spectrum before? <laughs> 
You guys know what a power spectrum is? No. So do you know what uh, autocorrelation is? Yeah. Yes. Right, so an autocorrelation if, is if I would measure the position of my object at some time t and at some other time zero, and I take the average of that, right? And so this object here, it's related to the variance. Um, but because these times are different, it's telling me about how the motion is correlated from one time to another. Okay? And so this thing is going to tell you about the amplitude of the Brownian motion of the particle and also the time scales. If this t here is very large, then there's going to be very little correlation with where it used to be a long time ago. But if t is small, there's going to be some correlation between the two. Okay? So by making this measurement, you can actually get both time scales and amplitude for fluctuations. Make sense? Okay. Now, what is a power spectrum? This power spectrum is simply the Fourier transform of this. Okay? That's all it is. So this is what a, a power spectrum would look like for different sized beads in blue, red, and green. And it has this characteristic shape. There is basically there's a model for this. And essentially, that's what we do. We, we fit this to uh, this model. And basically, what we're doing is we're fitting the amplitude of this noise and the time scales of the noise to get these two fitting, these two calibration parameters that we need. Okay, how to convert from voltage to position and how to convert position into force. That's the basic idea. It depends on the particles themselves, the size of the particles, but as long as you know what, how big your particles are, you can actually do this calibration and determine these two parameters. So that's the basic idea. We essentially use the fact that this thing fluctuates around, you just measure that, take a tr Fourier transform, and then you get this B. If you don't understand the details, it's not so important, right? Just kind of the, the basic idea of how we do this is, is the main thing that's important. Any questions on this? I see some puzzled looks on some people's faces. Yeah, question. Remind me, the legend lists a few things in micrometers. Remind me what those mean again, what those are relevant for. Uh, a few things. That, oh, sorry, these guys. Yeah, these are the different sizes of beads. Okay? So for different objects, you're going to get different types of, of uh, response in the trap. And this red curve basically is telling you that at low frequencies, your bead is moving by, has a certain amplitude of noise. And if you go faster than that, and basically you're looking at, at uh, time scales that are faster than the thing can move around. And so you're seeing less and less noise. So this point here is basically, that's the characteristic time scale for the fluctuations uh, of this particle inside the trap. And you can use that to figure out what the stiffness of the trap is. The amplitude, you can use it to figure out the conversion between voltage and, uh, and position. That's the basic idea. Don't sweat the details. It's just important to get kind of like a basic flavor of how you do this. OK, so we've essentially established the three important uh, elements. We can manipulate things, we can measure them, and then we can turn them into useful units of uh, position and uh, force. Now, the next important thing is that you can actually trap living things. And so that came in 1987. That's a Nature paper. Uh, again, Ashkin prominently involved, where they trapped and manipulated individual cells using infrared laser beams. And the important thing is that they used infrared. And the reason why infrared is important, as opposed to visible light, is that people have shown that cells respond OK to IR light. If you try to do trap a living cell um, in visible light, then essentially there's absorption processes and other funky chemistry that basically is toxic to the cell. You get photo damage of the cell. And my own lab was able to, you can also get some of these effects at the molecular level. And part of the issue is that you create these reactive oxygen species that lead to photo damage. So if you work in the IR, meaning you know 970, the standard wavelength is 1064, lots of lasers are at that wavelength you minimize the amount of damage that you get from absorption of visible light. So that's where most people do their optical trap experiments of living things in the IR. Uh, 
Okay, so now we have a quantitative measuring tool, and so we can use this now to probe biological processes, and there's very different ways we can do so. But the basic idea, well, let me explain the slide first, and then we can talk about what the basic idea is. So here's one classic experiment that was done with, um, uh, by Stephen Block's lab at Stanford, where you can go to this molecule, kinesin, right? That was one of the movies that we saw, and essentially play a tug of war between kinesin and your optical trap. So you can't trap kinesin itself. What you can do is trap, like I said, a micron-sized particle, and you can functionalize this so that it binds to one end of the kinesin. As kinesin tries to walk along its track called the microtubule, it moves in one direction, and you play a tug of war with the bead that you put in an optical trap. Right? So you can measure basically how much force a kinesin can exert. Um, you can also measure its step size, because every time kinesin takes a step forward, it pulls this bead out of the trap. That's something you can detect by, this tech, by back focal plane interferometry, and so you get information about a whole bunch of things. Um, here's another experiment where now you're looking at DNA polymerase. So this is one of the motors that was involved in the second movie during DNA replication. This is the enzyme that basically fills in and makes copies of the of DNA. So here's an example where they stretched a molecule of DNA between a trapped bead and another one that's fixed in space. They basically put it by suction on top of a micropipette. And the DNA that they made was half double-stranded DNA and half single-stranded DNA. And the DNA polymerase basically sits at the junction between the two. And essentially, it takes nucleotides from the environment and fills in the single-stranded DNA and turns it into double-stranded DNA. And so that, how do you actually measure something? Well, it turns out that the elasticity, the elastic properties of single-stranded DNA are different than double-stranded DNA. And so as you stretch this molecule at a particular tension, every time the polymerase fills in um, nucleotides and turns this single-stranded DNA to double-stranded DNA, that changes the mechanical properties of this DNA. And so this bead moves out of the trap. So you get a readout for the polymerase activity of the DNA polymerase. Uh, here's an, another one. I can keep going on with this, but I'll just show you three. This is actually from my postdoctoral work. So this is looking at a motor that is involved in, uh, in viral assembly. So viruses, they, they're composed of a, a, a protein shell. And these particular viruses assemble inside an infected cell, but the DNA is not inside the, the, the viral shell yet. And so what they have to do, they have a motor that actually takes the DNA, its own DNA, and packages it inside this small uh, uh, proteinaceous uh, uh, container called a capsid. And so here we basically play tug of war using two optical traps, two bees and two optical traps, and this motor as it's trying to reel in its DNA against these forces. And so as this thing is reeling in, it moves the beads out of the trap. That's something you can measure. Uh, so you get a readout. So you get the idea. Essentially what you're going to do is create a single molecule tether between your optical trap and a fixed point, like the microtubule on the surface or uh, another pipette, uh, a bead on a pipette, or maybe two optical traps. And by creating this tether, you basically work out the, the experiment in such a way that the molecule you're interested in changes the length of that tether, and that moves your bead out of the trap, and so you can measure a displacement and a force. So that's how you design a single molecule optical trap experiment, okay? That's the basic idea. Tethering is kind of one of the key things that, that we do. So uh, if you think about it, this is kind of an old idea, right? It dates back to, uh, to medieval times, that by stretching things, you get information out of them, right? So this is, the, uh, this is what we do with our molecules. We put them on the rack. That's my dumb joke for today. And the inquisitor says, what is your step size? <laughs> yes. So, yeah, in my lab, I like to think we torture our molecules to reveal information about, about biology. Okay. So, um, I gave you all the basic principles of optical trap, but, but let's start applying this to just kind of give you a flavor of how you would do one of these experiments and what the instruments look like. So this is an optical trap uh, layout in the basement in my lab. Um, there's a few components that are important. So one is there a laser, a very strong IR laser that's behind this box here. We cover it up because 
Uh, we don't want air and dust to get in the way, so it's under there. Let's highlight this piece right here. This is where you have your lenses. So this objective lens is the one that actually takes the laser light and focuses it down inside your aqueous chamber to a very tight point. This is what actually creates the traps by creating this large gradient. This one is the same objective, but it has a different role. It basically collects the light from the optical traps. So this is like a condenser. Collects this light, and now this light gets imaged onto these things, which are our position-sensitive photodetectors. So these tell us about the positions of the trapped object relative to the center of the trap. Okay. So I joke to my kids that this is really a really expensive Lego set. You basically build these things. It's all custom built. Uh, of course, the objectives we buy commercially, but all these stages and things like that are just components that we buy from companies and put them together to, uh, to make an instrument. So, yeah. So if you, if you go back to that previous slide, the wall there looks like is that you're in an anechoic chamber? Is that I'm sorry, what? It, it looks like you've got kind of sp foamy spikes. On yeah, the I'm going gonna, gonna to get, I'm gonna get to that in, the, in, in a few slides. So let's do kind of a classic experiment, something that maybe a beginning graduate student in my lab uh, would do, just to kind of give you a flavor of how you would do this, these experiments. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to, so my lab studies a lot of um, processes that happen on DNA. So we'll look at protein DNA interactions. So we do a lot of stuff with DNA, and one of the constructs that we use is something called a DNA hairpin. And essentially, we use molecular biology tools to synthesize this thing that looks like, like this. So it has two uh, double-strand DNA uh, molecules, and they're linked together by something called a hairpin. Basically, it's, it's, a, it's a DNA sequence that's complementary, so it zips up together to form this kind of structure. Uh, another thing that we do is we essentially modify the ends of the DNA to have these chemical groups. One of them is called biotin, and the other one is a molecule called digoxygenin. And the reason why we do this is because we can buy beads commercially that have molecules that are complementary to the biotin and the digoxygenin. Um, let's see, when, has TJ kind of, ex have you guys seen these molecules before, biotin and digoxygenin? Biotin maybe, okay. What's that? Biotin, yeah. Isn't, what makes biotin special again? Isn't it the one with like the strongest non covalent Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. So biotin binds to streptavin in, in a very tight manner. So if you buy a bead that has, that's coated with streptavin, you essentially can form this molecular Velcro that's very, very tight while not being covalent. And so that's useful. Uh, for this end, what we do is we coat this bead with an antibody against this small molecule, digoxygenin. And so the, the the use of this uh, construct is that you essentially have a specific attachment geometry where this DNA molecule can only attach to one type of bead and the other type of bead, and it's always in the same orientation and so forth, okay? So you're never mixing anything up, and so that's how you create one of these single molecule DNA tethers. Okay. So, um, and you know, the molecular biology used to actually synthesize something like this. It's pretty standard now. You can do this with a test tube. There's a recipe for doing it. Um, and so we, we really designed these to, you know, within base pairs. Okay, so let me show you how you would actually do an experiment. So this is the picture I showed you before. We are with uh, our objective and our condenser, and we have a, a, a fluidic chamber. which is essentially made of two pieces of glass, two cover slips, microscope cover slips, and then we put parafilm between the two that we basically engrave to have this particular uh, behavior. So it's, it's made out of parafilm, and so we have one channel, another channel, and then a channel in the middle. And we have small glass capillaries that allow these to be shunted together. So what we do is we flow in a certain type of bead in the top channel, It'll be a streptavidin bead on which we've put in our DNA construct. In the bottom channel, we'll flow in our anti-dig, or anti-digoxygenin bead. And then some of these will be flowing through the main channel through these small shunts here. And then what we do is we come in with our trap. We trap one, trap the other one. We assemble everything in situ inside this chamber, and then we form a tether 
right there. So let me show you a movie of what that looks like, and then you can ask me questions. Okay, so the hash marks are where the traps are. You don't see them because they're in IR, and the, the, the camera just sees visible. And now we're basically at the bottom here, where this glass capillary is where we're flushing in this type of bead, the anti-digoxygenin bead. Now, so here's one. Oh, you can see it fell into the trap. So this is about a micron in size. And you can see the action of light on it. And so now we're going to go to the top one here. That's this here. We have the other type of bead that we're flushing in. Okay, here's, here's a good candidate. Let me try to get it. Okay, maybe not. Let's try another one. Oh, maybe we're going to get it. Okay, here we go. So we've got two traps. Oh, sorry, two beads and two traps. We know these are of the opposite kind of beads because we know one came from the top, one came from the bottom. And now we're going to form a tether. And the way we form a tether is simply by rubbing the two uh, together. So we bring them together. We actually have a, a, a way of controlling the position of one trap relative to the other. And then we just rub them. And then we uh, knock on wood. And then we pull them apart. So you can see that they're being rubbed against each other. And we pull them apart. And if we see a force at an action, not force at an action, force at a distance between the two beads, then we know that means that we have a molecule between the two. We've created a single molecule tether. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, this is all done remotely. So there's a student basically operating a joystick, a couple of joysticks, manipulating one trap relative to the other, moving the stage around and everything, and just looking at a computer screen doing this. But they're not in the instrument room doing any of this. So the lesson is, you can go back to your parents and tell you that playing video games actually pays uh, for, for graduate school. This is, this is how we do this. OK, do you guys have questions on how we do this? OK, so you assemble everything in situ in the chamber. Um, and so going back to um, our DNA hairpin construct, basically, if we've done things successfully, we should have formed a tether that looks like that. Right? So we have one end is our uh, biotin streptavidin. The other end is uh, anti-digoxygenin. Digoxygenin, it's hard to say. And what we're going to do is now we're going to pull these apart with some force. And so what we're going to do is look at the force that we measure on our traps using the techniques I described to you. And also look at the extension of the molecule, basically the distance from this point to this point, the end-to-end -end distance of the molecule. That's the extension here. And then, so as we start to pull, you get a curve that looks like that. So we're looking at the elasticity of this molecule. You notice it's not a straight line because DNA is a very nonlinear molecule. It's not a Hookian spring. It's very nonlinear. In fact, this dotted black line here is a model called the worm-like chain model. Have you guys heard about the worm-like chain model? Yeah, OK. So it's a very well-established model for, for polymer physics. And it works beautifully for double-strand DNA. And so you can see that it fits on here beautifully. OK, so we're essentially stretching this molecule. Now, what eventually happens is you reach a force where you can actually unravel this hairpin. You're breaking up the base pairs by using force, just mechanical force. And so you can see what happens to this molecule as we do that. We open it. And if you look at, you can see that it starts to break open. Okay, it opens and opens and opens until we get to this point where we essentially stretch this thing completely and then we keep pulling, then we're stretching the molecule itself. So this is an example of mechanically unfolding a molecule, in this case a DNA hairpin. We're using force to break the bases, the base pairs um, of this hairpin. And it's reversible, so if you go in the opposite direction in green, then you get back the same curve. Um, so, very simple experiment, but it's very useful. In fact, if you had done this circa 2005 or 4, it would be a science paper. But now it's so standard that a first-year graduate student in my lab would be able to do it. OK, so we've done 45 minutes. Should we take a five-minute break and then talk about more up-to-date applications? Let's do that. <laughs>
take a five minute break and then we'll, we'll come back. Missing one person. Okay. So you guys usually finish at 3.20, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Let's get started. Okay, so um, for the rest of the talk, I'm basically going to give you example applications of this technology in my lab. Um, and one thing I'm going to highlight is uh, talking about resolution in optical traps. And so the standard geometry for an optical trap experiment is you use a single optical trap, you have a bead in it, and then you have some kind of tether, in this case DNA. And the other end of the DNA is attached to your microscope stage. And that works fine. That's worked fine for you know, 15, 20 years. But the problem with this setup is that usually stages tend to drift over time. 
And so what happens is as this stage drifts, it essentially pulls this bead out of the trap. And so you're getting a signal on top of the signal that you want from your biological molecule um, that is extra noise. And that's ultimately going to limit the resolution of signals that you can get with this kind of apparatus. And so people have been moving away from that, including my lab, which is to use two optical traps. And the idea here is that you form both of these optical traps from the same laser. You can do this a number of ways. One of them is to use polarization. You can basically send half your light in the horizontal polarization, half your light in vertical polarization. And the idea is that if your laser drifts, then both of your traps drift together. And so you eliminate this source of noise that you have in the classic way of doing an optical trap measurement. And so dual trap designs are insensitive to drift. Here's my schematic of your laser drifting. Basically, both traps drift together, and so their separation doesn't change. And so you don't get this uh, noise signal that you don't want. And so by doing this, you can actually get really sensitive. You can get sensitive enough where you can actually see a protein moving on the scale of a single DNA base pair. That's only 3.4 angstroms. And so there have been several um, example applications of what people have, have, have used this technology for. And I'm going to give you uh, another one that we published recently, just last year. Um, oh, yeah, so you're asking me about you know, the room that we do this in. So you, if you want to get down to this level, and just remember, hydrogen atom is one angstrom. So we're detecting signals that are only a factor of three times larger, really tiny things. You're subject to all sorts of environmental fluctuations. And so my labs, my optical traps, are inside these uh, temperature controlled acoustical foam coated uh, rooms to basically you know, reduce any environmental factors. Um, I also showed you how everything is computer controlled by joysticks. Basically, the students are outside of this room. They load their samples in, close the door, and then they have several hours of working with the joysticks where they don't, they're not inside the room uh, you know, moving things around and, and causing extra noise. So it's basically as quiet as you can possibly be. Um, and I joke, this is where these are padded cells where I keep my graduate students until they graduate. Uh, right. Okay, so let me tell you about a particular application of this technique. So we've been interested in helicases. Helicases are molecular machines or molecular motors that are responsible for breaking open the bases of DNA. And so this happens, we saw in the movie earlier, when you need to make copies of the DNA because you need to separate the two strands to, to use as templates to make uh, daughter DNA. Uh, but it's also involved in DNA repair. So whenever you have a problem with your DNA, for example, uh, you get you exposed to UV, you get a site of damage, well, you need to unwind around that site of damage and remove that DNA. There's a repair process that's responsible for that. So helicases are involved in all sorts of genome maintenance processes. And we got interested in this particular one called XPD. Um, XPD stands for Xeroderma Pigmentosum Group D Protein. This is a disease that you get where you become hypersensitive to UV. You get all sorts of uh, skin problems if you have a mutation to this helicase. It's involved in DNA repair. And so this thing um, has this following structure. So there's these two domains that basically contact single-stranded DNA an arch domain, and basically what it does is it moves along single strand DNA using energy from the molecule ATP. I'm assuming everybody knows what ATP is. Yes. Okay. So they move along single strand DNA. Whoops. And then when they hit a junction between single strand DNA and double strand DNA, then they unwind it. And this one in particular unwinds it from the five prime to three prime direction. You also have helicates that move in the opposite sense. Okay. And so, you know, some questions that were out, that are out in the field is, for example, what is the step size for a helicase unwinding? Um, when people have done traditional bulk measurements, or they're looking at many, many of these in a test tube, they got all sorts of numbers from one to six base pairs step size, meaning that when it unwinds, does it unzip one base pair at a time or many of them at the same time? Um, and so that's something that we wanted to address. Another thing that we wanted to address is what is the mechanism for helicase unwinding? So there's kind of two extremes you can imagine. One is called an active mechanism, 
which means that the helicase basically acts like a, like a snow plow. It basically breaks open the base pairs uh, by a wedge, for example. And the other extreme is called a passive mechanism, which basically has to do with um, it, it, the, the helicase relies on thermal opening of the base pairs. So the idea would be that the base pairs would open on their own just through thermal fluctuations. And all the helicase does is it waits for it to be open, slides in. Okay, and then the next one kind of can open by thermal fluctuations and it just slides in. So this is known as a passive mechanism. Or it could be anywhere in between. And so what we did is we studied this helicase by using a hairpin, same hairpin that we were dealing with earlier. That's why I showed it. Um, and so here's the idea. We're essentially going to stretch on this hairpin to a certain tension, but a tension lower than what we needed to unfold it. Okay, so just stretch it just a little bit. And we're going to maintain that force constant. And the way we do that is essentially we run this whole thing in a feedback loop so that we, if there's ever a change in the length of the molecule, we essentially keep pulling until we reach the same force. Okay, so we maintain the same tension in the molecule. Okay, and now we flow in some protein. So here's our XPD. We actually engineered a little binding site there for so we can fit one, and then we add ATP, it starts to unwind. And what happens now is as it unwinds, the molecule gets longer, but since we're running this thing in a feedback loop to maintain a constant tension, that means that your traps move further and further apart as it unwinds it, okay? So is the assay clear how we're doing this? Okay. And so now this becomes the readout for the unwinding activity of this helicase. We measure delta X, how much we have to move one trap relative to the other. Okay, now there's a slight problem here is that when the helicase unwinds the DNA, if there's other helicase in solution, then basically they can bind to the wake of that first helicase and then we could have a train of these. And what we really wanted to do is avoid that. We wanted to look at the behavior of a single one of these. Okay, so what we did was, so here's the problem that we want to avoid. So how do you tell the activity of multiple helicases from a single helicase? What we did is we, did a trick. So we did a little bit of microfluidics, not really microfluidics, more like millifluidics. But so here's the, one of these chambers that I showed you before. What we do is we engineered the middle channel. This is where we formed our tether in the movie. But we actually make it out of two separate streams that combine right at that point. And the colors here are just different food dyes that we float into here. And now the flow is laminar. That means that there's very little turbulent mixing. And so what happens is that these two flows are basically just parallel to each other and they don't mix at all. So you notice that there's no purple color here. You just get blue and red. They're just flowing next to each other without mixing. And so here's a kind of a zoom in version of this where this point is here where we're putting a fluorescent dye in one stream and then nothing in the other. You can see it's a pretty sharp interface. And so the idea of doing this is that you can form your tether and assemble everything in one stream and then move it to the other, okay? So you can basically, you can load a molecule and then move it to another spot where you add the fuel, for example. So you guarantee yourself of having a single molecule on there. You can play all sorts of different tricks by using this. Does that make sense? How do you know that it's attached? How do you know what? The protein is attached to the... Ah, so you don't. In general, oh. you just have to do the experiment enough times to know that on average it takes 30 seconds or something like that for the molecule to attach. So basically, this is, this is what we did. So we essentially have uh, our parafilm here, and then we have three positions. At position one, we, we have our uh, molecule of DNA. We have XPD, but no fuel. So we, can only, we can't see anything. We just know that it might bind or come off. And we know to wait, like I said, about 30 seconds. <clears throat> and then we move to the other laminar stream, but now we're moving where there's ATP. And so this thing should be able to unwind but there's no other helicases around to give you any difficulty. So you're basically guaranteed of having a single helicase loaded on here, moving along your DNA. Okay, so this is kind of a typical trace that you would see. So initially it's flat, now you move to ATP and you start to see unwinding and then eventually the protein falls off and then you flat line again, okay? And so one thing I wanna highlight is that a single helicase doesn't just do one thing. It actually does multiple things. It goes back and forth five times on this one. But in general, it does this um, many times. It seems to 
do this repetitive unwinding motion on DNA, going back and forth. Um, the other thing, too, is you can zoom in on what it's doing when it's unwinding DNA. Oh, one thing I should mention is that the whole hairpin is about 90 base pairs long, and this thing is only unwinding about you know, 10 to 15. It's actually a pretty wimpy helicase. It can only go a little bit, and then it seems to crap out, fall backwards, and do this many, many times. And I'll tell you at the end why we think this is important. OK, but so if we zoom in, I want to relate this to our high-resolution optical traps. Um, if you zoom in, you can actually see stepping motion. So each of these corresponds to a single unwinding step of this helicase. case. The gray data is basically the raw data collected at a high frequency, and then we filter it down to get this. And so if you do this over many, many molecules, and you take a histogram of the pair of distances between every point, you essentially get this periodic repeat, which tells you what the step size is. You get one base pair step size. So this establishes without any doubt that the step size of this helicase case is one base pair. You can also use other analysis methods to identify the steps and do a histogram of this. And so here's what it looks like. You get a big peak at one. That's telling you that the step size is one. You notice you also get some twos. That's maybe because you missed one. And so you see you know, it was a, you see two base pairs unwinding at the same time. But the other thing that you notice is you also get lots of negative ones. So this helicase is really inefficient. It steps forward a lot, but it also steps backward a lot. If this was a car engine, right, you would return it. It's like 10% of the time it actually switches. It goes in the reverse direction. You would not like that at all. Um, so we got interested into like, why did it behave in this way, with this complex stepping behavior. And because we have base pair resolution, we can actually correlate each individual step with the sequence of DNA that it's unwinding. Right, so each position here, not only do you get step size, but you also know what DNA sequence is behind it and in front of it, right? the ATs and GCs that are there. And so what we can do is we can look at the dwell time. How long does it stay here when this is a CG versus when it's an AT and so forth? You can do that. You can also look at the probability of going forward or backwards. So that's the dwell time. The other one is right, going forward or backward at each position. So here, notice, same position, but once it went backwards, and the other one it went forwards. Right? So we can look at the probabilities by doing this experiment over and over and over again, and essentially correlate these two things with DNA sequence. Now, DNA sequence is important because um, CGs are harder to unwind than ATs. Okay? So it takes a different amount of energy to break this compared to this, right? And so that might be reflected in these different dwell times. So if we do the analysis, basically this is what we do. We look at the probability of stepping backwards, the dwell time as a function of sequence. I'll skip all the details in the interest of time. Basically, you can address this question of whether it's active or passive. So if it's active, then the rate of stepping forward should be independent of the sequence. The P open basically is a, is a proxy for sequence. On the other hand, if it's passive, then the rate of stepping forward should be proportional to the probability that the hairpin opens just from thermal fluctuations, which depends on sequence. OK, and so using all the data that I showed you, we put it all together, and we got something that looks like that. So it looks an awful lot, awful lot more like passive. So it seems like this helicase behaves like a passive engine. It essentially waits for thermal fluctuations to break open base pairs, and then it slides in when they open, and then it keeps doing that going forward. And that explains why it's such a crappy helicase, why it takes uh, so long to do so, to, to move forward. Uh, you can do some modeling. You can show that it's not quite passive. There is this U interaction. It's basically you know, the contribution from the helicase itself. How much energy does it provide to unwind the base pairs itself? It's not a whole lot. So it's definitely more towards this extreme than the active extreme. <laughs>
So you can kind of see the kind of information, detailed information you get on these enzymes by uh, doing optical trapping and then looking at um, base pair level stepping. OK, so the other thing I want to talk about before we wrap up is kind of the next generation of optical trap instruments. And so I'm going to talk about how we've been combining optical traps with single molecule fluorescence, which I'm assuming you've been hearing about from uh, Professor Ha. And so going back to this data for XPD, you know, it's very nice that you can track this molecule with base pair precision on DNA. It's pretty amazing when you think about it. But ultimately, you get very little information about you know, what's going on internally with this protein? What, what about what's going on? It's, it's, what's, what's its conformational state? You get no information on that. And that's pretty unsatisfying because you're trying to understand the mechanism by which this thing works, right? So wouldn't it be nice if you can combine something like that with some other readout where you can understand what's going on inside this protein? Maybe it's doing, you know, it's a pretty complicated three-dimensional structure. Maybe it's doing some interesting things that are helping it unwind or, or something else. You are completely blind to that, but it'd be nice if you could actually look at that. And so that is a big motivation for combining these optical trap techniques with other modalities that allow you to measure things at the same time. And so that's something that we developed. And so fluorescence is an ideal way to do this because you can use things like single molecule fret. I'm assuming you've all heard about single molecule fret already. Okay, good because you can look at conformational states and dynamics with FRET. So this is an example from uh, the Ha lab. It's an animation from the Scholten lab. This is the ribosome. This is the machine that makes other proteins. And they were able to see that there's this ratcheting mechanism by using FRET, by essentially using the fact that two dyes change separation um, to get um, uh, FRET efficiency and determine the, the dynamics. So wouldn't it be nice if you could combine something like this with the optical traps. You can correlate the function of this molecule, in other words, how it moves along DNA, with its structure, its conformation. So that's what we've done. We call them the fleezers, because fluorescence plus tweezers equals fleezers. Um, and it was a huge challenge to do it. We were the first to do it. I mean, so the idea was there for a while. People had built instrument that, that uh, combined fluorescence and optical traps, but they did it in such a way that essentially you compromised one of the capabilities. You either had a compromised trap or a compromised fluorescence, but we really wanted to do it so that you had the full power of both techniques simultaneously. And so that's what we did. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip kind of the details of how you do this. I'll just tell you that the way you have to do it, um, let me skip this. Skip this as well. So let me show you a demonstration that, that proves that we could actually do this. So what we did is we made a molecule of DNA that was mostly double-strand DNA, but we left a single-strand DNA gap in the middle. And then in solution, we float in uh, a nine-nucleotide single-strand DNA molecule with a single psi 3 di molecule bound to it. This molecule, this blue, is complementary to the single-strand DNA binding site on the DNA. And so as the thing is float, floating around in solution, sometimes it binds and hybridizes to the site on DNA. And when that happens, you basically see a nice fluorescent spot showing up between your beads. And you can read that out. So you basically get single molecule fluorescence detection. Now at the same time that this happens, remember how I, we talked about that experiment with DNA polymerase, that single strand DNA and double strand DNA have different mechanical properties. Well, whenever this happens, you're changing nine nucleotides into nine base pairs. And so there's a slight change in the size of this molecule that you can pick up with your trap at the same time. That's shown in blue. It's a very small change. It's less than a nanometer. You can measure it over and over again. And so you can basically, this shows that you have simultaneous ability to detect single fluorophores and a very small trap signal on the order of only five angstroms. Okay, so it's basically demonstrating that you can do both of these things simultaneously. And so we've been applying this to understand other molecular machines. Another helicase. This one is called UVRD, but 
For the purposes of this talk, it's basically the bacterial cousin of XPD, the one that I showed you before. Um, similar type of structure, some differences. It's also involved in DNA repair. Uh, it uses ATP to move. It moves in the opposite direction. It goes three prime to five prime. XPD goes five prime to three prime. Um, and so there were a couple problems that we're interested in. So that looks exactly the same as before. There are two kind of debates going on in this field. So UVRD is kind of a classic example of a certain type of helicase, and there's many different uh, helicases that fit in that family, and so people have been interested in these types of motors for a while. So one of the questions is, how many helicases do you actually need to unwind DNA? So people agree that helicases can translocate on single-strand DNA. They disagree over how many you actually need to unwind DNA for this particular type. And the debate happened because, according to the crystal structures, a single one of these should be fine to unwind DNA. But when people did biochemical experiments, they thought that you need at least two to unwind DNA. And basically, a single one is too weak to do anything. You need two, maybe to interact together or push each other to unwind the DNA. And so we wanted to resolve this debate. And the way we did it is by putting a dye molecule on each one of these using our hairpin assay to measure unwinding with the optical trap, and then using our fluorescence to count number of proteins. Very simple idea. Okay, that's number one. Number two has to do with the structure of this protein, the conformational state. So people had shown with uh, x-ray structures that UVRD comes into two different states called open and closed. And all the difference is, is that this domain here called 2B can swivel by about 160 degrees relative uh, in the, in the two structures. And so when it's closed, it's like this. When it's open, it's like that. Um, and the question is, which one of these is actually doing anything? So people disagreed about this. So the crystal structures show that it's closed at DNA junction, and so structural biologists said the closed state, this one here, is the one that's competent to unwind. But then when people did biochemical experiments, they thought the opposite, that the open one should be the one that unwinds. In fact, they said the closed one is actually stalled. So we wanted to resolve this issue, and so we did a FRET experiment. Where we put a donor and acceptor pair on this domain, this 2B domain that swivels around, and the rest of the molecule that stays static. And so we should be able to tell whether it's open or closed based on the fret state. Right? So high fret means it's closed, low fret means it's open. And we can do this simultaneously with watching it unwind on a DNA hairpin using our optical trap. That's the idea. So same hairpin assay as we did before, only now we add fluorescence. And so we monitor both the number of proteins and the conformational state by fluorescence simultaneously with watching it. OK, so here's the first experiment where now we just count proteins. So this is using a protein in which we've put a single dye molecule on it. And we're just going to watch the fluorescence to count how many proteins we have. On it. So here's two plots because we see two different types of activities. This is um, when we see a single photobleaching step. So a single photobleaching step just means that the dye eventually went dark. And because you see a single step, that tells you that you have a single dye molecule or a single molecule of UVRD. OK? Make sense? Yep. Now, simultaneously with this, we watch it unwind with our optical trap, our hairpin assay. That's shown in blue. As you can see, while the protein is on there, it's unwinding only about 12 base pairs. Again, we have a long hairpin. It's only unwinding a small amount, and it's going back and forth. Similar to what we saw with XPD, it's just going back and forth. And here again, see it going back and forth. So when there's a single helicase on there, it does unwind, but it does so very inefficiently, and it does in a repetitive manner, very reminiscent to what we saw with the other protein. On the other hand, if we count two photobleaching steps, that tells us that we've loaded two proteins onto our DNA, right? Now we see that the unwinding is very different. The unwinding is now much more processive. So it's unwinding almost the whole hairpin, 
and then going around the other side and going back down. And so we see a huge difference depending on whether we've loaded a single or double uh, helicase. So here's a histogram when you repeat this experiment many times. As a function of the number of photo bleaching steps, how far do you go? How many base pairs do you unwind? And so the answer seems to be that a single one can unwind, but it's just kind of a very weak helicase. And it's only when you have two or maybe more that they somehow either push each other or interact somehow to be a much more possessive uh, engine and unwind a whole bunch of DNA questions. Oh, here, yeah. So we do notice that in this particular example, we see it, we don't always see it, but we do see some kind of effect around 12 base pairs. And we don't know why 12. We see plateaus around 6 and 12, and, and we don't really understand yet why those numbers are special. OK, now let me get to this FRET experiment. So this is a dual la labeled UVRD, right? And so we're going to use this again to look at whether the, this domain is open or closed. OK, and so uh, let's see. Now this is backwards. So this top here is the trap data in black. So this is showing a single helicase unwinding. It's going back and forth, like in the previous plot, right? Going back and forth, back and forth by a small amount. This one's not quite 12, it goes to 18. It goes back and forth, back and forth. And this is the donor and acceptor signals. So if you turn this into a fret efficiency, here it is in blue. Now you notice that the fret efficiency is not at one level. It's fluctuating a lot. So that's telling us that this thing is actually opening and closing, opening and closing, opening and closing. Let me draw some lines for you to guide your eye. So the low fret is the open state. The high fret is the closed state. So this is fluctuating a lot. And this is unwinding, going backwards, unwinding, going backwards, and so forth. By the way, just to highlight something, this is the noise here, right? This is when the protein has come off. So all this stuff here is not noise. It's real biological activity. So the question we had is, you know, why is this going on here? Why is this? Is there a correlation between the two? That's kind of the point of doing these measurements simultaneously. So let me show intervals of time where it's in red in the closed state and in green in the open state. OK, and the quiz for you guys, I didn't tell you there's going to be a quiz. OK, but the quiz for you is to figure out, can you correlate this with this? Can you see a correlation between these two plots? Yeah. Well, derivative, or let's put it another way, then whenever it's in the closed state, it's going up on average. It's unwinding. And then when it's in the open state, it's doing the opposite. It's allowing the DNA to reanneal. Everybody see that? Now, there's other features in there. There's pauses and other stuff. But on, in general, that's what happens. And so if you repeat this experiment many, many times, so each of these dots corresponds to a separate interval in these types of diagrams over several molecules. You can see that there's a clear correlation. Here we're just plotting velocity and then fret. So when you have high fret, that's closed state, it's unwinding, positive velocity. When you have low fret, it's reannealing, negative velocity. So there's a correlation between whether this thing is in the open or closed state and the directionality in which it moves. This was completely unexpected. So this is closed state, this is open state. It seems like this conformational switch corresponds to, uh, uh, to helicase directionality, right? whether it's unwinding or reannealing. So what we think is actually going on is as follows. This is based on uh, other experiments that people have done. If people have modeled that this, uh, that this helicase can actually switch strands. So let's say it's moving 3 prime to 5 prime in this unwinding direction. There's a chance that it could actually switch to the other strand and still moving 3 prime to 5 prime. But now if it moves in that direction, that allows the DNA to reanneal in its wake. Okay. So we think that's actually what's going on and that this 2P domain, so they've shown through the structures that this blue domain actually acts like an anchor to the double-strand DNA. 
And this open and close basically corresponds to which strand the, DNA, the, the helicase is unwinding on. The unwinding strand or the renal link strand. It's still moving in the same direction, 3 prime to 5 prime on each strand. It's just relative to the fork, which direction it's moving in. So we seem to have discovered this mechanism by which this helicase can go back and forth on DNA without actually falling off. Now, obviously, the only way you can get at that is through measurement like I described, where you can correlate the function of the helicase with its structural or conformational state. So that's basic idea. So we haven't published this yet. So this is uh, uh, hot research in the lab. We ha it hasn't come out yet. OK, I'm going to skip the last section. I told you I had a whole bunch of extra slides. It's not important that we go through them. Um, So, so yeah, so this is a, a powerful technique. Um, it, the, the kind of themes in, of research in my lab is, is that you know, we, we, we try to be quantitative about things. There is, as physicists, that's what we want to do. So we, we go from quantification of a biological system, and for example, we can measure step sizes, dwell times. We want numbers, right? probabilities. And from those, we can develop quantitative models. Right? That's always the end point, is we want to develop a theory that has predictive power and has equations and mathematics involved in it. Uh, and to reach that, we also develop new techniques. So we do things at the single molecule level, high resolution, base pair resolution, or we look at multiple things, multiple measurables at the same time. Um, and just in general, the nature of the research is, is uh, something that really appeals to me because you get to wear many different hats as a biophysicist. You get to be an experimentalist in the sense of what we think of experimentalists for physicists, is that we build instruments, we develop techniques to answer scientific questions. Uh, you also get to be a biochemist because you know, think about the biology, you develop the biological systems, you, you modify it or you, you tweak with it so they can study it. And at the end, you also get to be a theorist because you want to come up with a quantitative model of the data that you took. And so I think that's still pretty unique to biophysics that you can get to be all three of these things in, in one particular lab. And so, okay, that's it for today. So I kind of gave you some of the basics of how you do optical trapping and also two kinds of experiments that we do in the lab that uh, are at, at, at the cutting edge of what people do in, in, uh, with optical traps. OK, so the, the helicase stepping behavior with uh, XPD, that's a graduate student, Zha, who is now a postdoc at Columbia University. We did a collaboration with Maria Spies of the University of Iowa. She used to be here, but she moved a few years ago. The stuff with the fleezers is uh, led by Matt Comstock, the postdoc in the lab, uh, jointly with Takji Pa, who is now faculty at Michigan State University, and now a graduate student in biophysics. Kevin Whitley is taking that over. And we're also collaborating with Tim Lohman. So he's the uh, biochemist who's provided the UVRD and, and all these different constructs. And I didn't have, to talk, didn't have time to talk about how we trap cells and look at cellular behavior. That'll be for a different talk. OK, and so that's it. If you guys have questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Um, or not. It's up to you. OK. OK, next. Yep. So, less so. So, the pro so XPD is the nicest to work on because it's actually slow. And so you can see each individual step. You can do that even at, at saturating a DP concentration. You can still measure the step size. For UVRD, it's a lot faster. Um, and so we have a much harder time to measure the step size. Now, where we have looked, it seems like we're seeing a three base pair repeat. So we're seeing three, 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 you know, six features prominently, 12 features prominently in our data. Uh, but we haven't seen anything smaller than that. So maybe there's something special about three you know, maybe it unwinds in, in three base pair steps. We, we don't know. But, so I don't really have a, a good answer to give you yet. But that's something that we want to explore further. Yeah. Can you just lower the ATP concentration on the uh, second system you talked about? There? UVRD. Um, yeah, because it's too fast uh, at saturation. Yeah. Or are you afraid that you'll change the no, no, so that's always a trick you can play uh, of lowering the, the, the ATP concentration. We just haven't really done it very carefully. We've been focusing on this conformational switch because we, we, it's, a, it's kind of a, a question that a lot of people have been wanting yeah. to answer. Okay.
Anyone else? Okay, thanks.